16. Verse 10. Are you out when you're ready? Is it recording? Already? Okay. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 16, verse 10. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Amen. Amen. I remember that when I was young, uh, especially in spring and summer, I mean, throughout the year, I used to play soccer with my friends. We usually go to the soccer field around 3, 4 o'clock and we would play until dusk. And... Uh, there's something interesting I want to share with you this morning. When we had enough boys to form two teams uh, as the regular soccer teams, we would have uh, goalies. And I was very happy because I am a goalie. And when we have something like uh, a draft in the beginning, just like the basketball, they have a draft, they pick the best players. And they would pick the best place. And when we had a goalie, I was their first pick. They chose me because I was an outstanding goalie. But when we didn't have enough, if we wouldn't have enough players, we wouldn't have goalies in the game. Then I was in a pickle. Because I was a very good goalie, but I was very bad if I played in another position. So when the boys started to pick the players, I was always, always the last one to be picked. And when I went to the soccer field and I saw that there were not enough players and we, wouldn't going to, we were not going to have a goalie, I was annoyed. And I said, oh my God, I'm going to be the last to be picked again. But then... Then I, I, I came to realize that it doesn't matter if I, was, if I was the first to be picked or the last. The most important is that I was going to play with them and having fun. But one thing in, the, uh, in our lives, very important, is that we were created like that. We like to be cherished. We like to be committed. Uh, uh, I mean, we like to receive a compliment when we do something good, when we succeed. Uh, uh, it's part of the human nature. We don't like to be overlooked or ignored. Nobody likes to be despised, overlooked or ignored, especially when you do something important. Today I want to talk about it. I want to talk about a young man who was completely overlooked by his family, by his father, by his friends, by everybody. But someone that God has always kept his eyes on him. 
We are talking about David, David obviously. And we, we have just read the text where David is chosen to be the king of Israel. And we know the story. Uh, Samuel go to Bethlehem to uh, meet Jesse and to sacrifice in a way of showing Saul that he was going there to sacrifice, not to choose a king to replace him. And we know the story. He goes to Jesse's house and Jesse made his, have his sons pass in front of him, his seven sons. And the Lord tells Samuel, it's none of them. And then Samuel asks, are there? Uh, 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 is that all of your children, your sons? And said, you know what? I forgot. Oh my God, my head. How foolish I am. There is still the youngest one. He's in the field taking care of my flock. And Samuel said, call him. If he doesn't come here, we will not sit down to eat. And when Dave, David comes in, Samuel, who was impressed before with the beauty and height and good looking of, of, his, uh, uh, of David's oldest brother, he looks at David and says, that's the one. And the Lord said, anoint him because I have chosen him to be king in Israel. But something interesting is that David was anointed king of Israel in the midst of his brothers. What happened next? He went to Jerusalem, seated at the throne, and he started to reign over Israel? No. He was anointed king and went back, where? To the field, to keep tending his father's flock. So one thing that we have to understand is that sometimes God makes us a promise and we have to understand that He is faithful to fulfill His promises. But not in our time, but in His timing. If God promised you something, it means that in His timing, He, is, he will fulfill the promise, not yours. Some people uh, give up on the promises of the Lord and sometimes they just uh, 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 forget the promises God has made to them because they think that it's too late, that God has, forgot, have, has forgotten them, that it's too late. Maybe I didn't understand well. Maybe God does not have this promise in my life. But the point is, we have to understand, it's not our time, it's God's timing. And if God made you a promise, if it's a big blessing or a miracle or a promise, God will, will only fulfill it in your life when you're prepared, prepared to receive it. That's what we learned last week. With David, it was the same. David went back to the field. Or to the wilderness. Why? Because he needed to be in the field. Taking care of his father's flock. Because by tending his father's flock. God was going to prepare him. To be the greatest king of Israel. You know where David was prepared to be king? What is, it was not in the battlefield. David was prepared to be the greatest king of Israel. In the field. Alone, by himself, with his father's flock. Why? And that's what I want to highlight at first this morning. Because in the field, David had no distraction whatsoever in his life. He didn't have internet. He didn't have cable. He didn't have a car to go out with his friends. And enjoy some time with them. There is nothing wrong with that. But God had set him apart for something great. And God had to prepare him. Then he, he was not alone in the field. He was with the Father. David had time. 
He didn't have anyone. He couldn't play with the sheep. He couldn't talk with the sheep. So, David took all his time having fellowship with his heavenly father. He had been overlooked by his earthly father. But his heavenly father has never ignored him. Have you ever felt overlooked? Have you ever felt ignored? I have. And the feeling is awful. But let me tell you something. Even though you are overlooked by someone, God will never ignore you. God will ever have his eyes on you. Nobody saw the worth of David. For all Israel, Israel and in his family, he was just the youngest son. That's all. There was nothing special about David in his father's eyes, in his family's eyes, in his city's eyes, in his friend's eyes. But God saw his worth. And let me tell you something. God knows your worth. Even though sometimes you are overlooked or ignored, God knows your worth. And let me tell you something. If you believe in him, and if you seek him, he is going to honor you. He is going to use you and honor you. Because he chose you for a great work on this earth as well. Just like David. David had time to be with his father. David composed beautiful songs. Songs that we have nowadays. Songs that today bless so many people. How many people are blessed nowadays? Christians and non-Christians by the Psalms. They composed. And most of them they composed in the field. Or in the wilderness. You know the story of David. When he went to face Goliath, he told Saul, I'm not afraid of this giant. Because once a lioness came to steal away a sheep from my father's flock, and I stood against it, and I killed the lioness. And, some other t and another time, it came along a bear. And I stood against the bear, and I killed it. Some history, biblical historians believe that David was anointed by Samuel when he was around 8, 8 to 15 years old. I don't believe he was 18, 8 years old, but because I don't believe his father uh, would, would send a, a, an 80 year old kid to tend his flock in the field. I don't believe that. Maybe, perhaps, but I don't believe it. I myself would like to think that David was anointed by Samuel when he was around 12, 13 years old. And I myself, I would like to think that he was anointed when he was 12 years old. Because 12 years old for the Jew is the age when a boy comes to maturity. It's when they have their bar mitzvah that it's a great celebration for every uh, young uh, Jewish kid, young boy Jewish. So uh, David was anointed. And uh, so if he was anointed around 12 years old, it means that David killed a lion. And a bear when he was around 12, 13 years old. This is very hard for a grown up man. Can you imagine? And I myself, if I saw a lion or a bear coming, uh, running uh, 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 towards me, I would run as fast as I could. I would try to hide. And I am a grown up man. David was 12, 13 and he stood up against. He faced. He fought the lion and the bear. Where did it, his courage come from? That's what I highlight this morning with you. David spent time with God. 
He didn't spend time with his mother, with his father, with his friend. When he was in the field taking care of his father's flock, he had plenty of time to be with his heavenly father. And he knew God. We can see by his psalms that he knew God. And let me tell you something. The, the closer you are to God, the stronger you are going to be. You want to be strong? Don't go to the gym. Don't walk out every day, five, six hours. You're not going to be strong. If you want to be really strong, you spend time with the Lord every day. One, two, three, four hours. Be in the presence of the Lord. Seek His face, His face continuously. And you are going to be a strong person. Amen. Oh, let me rephrase this. You may continue physically a weak person, but spiritually in your mind and heart, you are, go you are going to be one of the strongest and mightiest persons on this earth. David, nobody saw his worth. He was a young man, 12, 13 years old. But at that time, he was one of the mightiest men there was in this earth. Why? Because he would spend time with the Father. He knew God. And the more you are with God, the stronger you are. That's why he... He stood up and killed the lion and the bear. Do you think David have a low self-esteem? He didn't. He didn't. Of course, I believe he missed his mother, his father, his house, his brothers, his friends. He was a teenager. Teenagers like to play and go out with his friends and talk. It's natural. But David didn't mind. Why? Because his only goal was to be obedient to his father. In fact, he had no choice. His father told him, go to the field and tend the flock. So he had no choice. He obeyed. But his, his, his earthly father didn't know at that time that in fact, he was not overlooking David. He was blessing him. He was preparing David so that his worth would be seen one day through all Israel. Do you think David complained when he came to, to the meal and said, Oh, come on, Father, you forgot me. I was in the field. You were not going to invite me. David didn't complain. In fact, we don't see David complaining in the Bible. We don't see him complaining. Even in, in, David, some believe. Some believe, some historians believe that David uh, had to wait more than 20 years to be the king of Israel. And most part of his life before being a king was running for his life in the wilderness. But we see David running from, from his life, going through a very hard time in the wilderness. But we don't see David complaining about God. We, we never see David reminding God that he had anointed him to be the king of Israel. He never did it. Why? Because David always understood that everything that happened in his life was what? Was a purpose of God. David was so sure that he once, that he eventually would sit at the throne of Israel. That for two, two times, he had the opportunity to kill Saul, a man who was pursuing him. And he didn't kill Saul. The second time, he rebuked Abner, that was the soldier, the captain of Israel's army, responsible to protect the king. And he rebuked Abner. See, he is the spear. Of the king. Where were you Abner? That you were not protecting. The anointed of the Lord. Instead of killing his enemy. He rebuked the soldier. Who didn't protect him. But you know why? Because David never saw Saul as an enemy. He always honored him. As the anointed of the Lord. What a great man. How David became. 
How did he become this great man in the field? Tending his father's flock, spending time with God. When you spend time with God, you fear nothing. And David didn't fear anything. Some say that uh, the Bible says that David became king when he was 30 years old. And he reigned for four years in Israel. So David died when he was 70. But before being the greatest king of Israel, he had to suffer to go through a lot of trials and hardships to be prepared to be king of Israel. The Bible says we are going to be, we are going to reign with the king of kings. Let me, let me, I have good news for you this morning. God has chosen David to be the king of Israel. But God has chosen you to reign with him across all, all the universe, over all the universe. We are going to reign with the king of kings. Our kingship will be way much greater than David's king. David was the king of Israel. We are going to reign with the Lord over all the universe. But it's interesting that who could, uh, who could imagine that a young boy from Bethlehem one day would be the greatest king of Israel. Oh yes, David was born in Bethlehem. Do you know that? A young boy. It's something interesting. Let's suppose David was anointed with 12 years old. But one thing we, need, we know for sure. David began to reign when he was 30 years old. A boy that was born in Bethlehem became the king of Israel and started to reign when he was 30 years old. I've heard about another boy who was born in Bethlehem that began his ministry when he was 30 years old also. He didn't become the greatest king of Israel. He became the king of the universe. And he's also the king of Israel. It's so beautiful when we compare David's life with Jesus' life. But I want to tell you something else about David. We all know that he was a very bold, courageous young man. He killed the bear, the lion, and he killed Goliath. He killed Goliath with only one stone. Can you imagine how much time David had to practice with his sling in the wilderness? He didn't have books. He didn't have friends. He was tired of talking to the sheep. Always saying something, the same answer. Uh, uh, he was tired. So, okay, let me do something. Let me practice with this thing. And every day he practiced. Every day he practiced. He was an expert in throwing a stone with the sling. There were men in Israel at that time. And I believe that David tended his flock and... Uh, uh, I believe that he didn't, uh, uh, he wouldn't sleep when he had to sleep there. He would look a, a, a safe place to sleep. And we know that there were uh, uh, hills in Israel. And I believe he would find a place in the hills or the cleft of a rock or a small cave to uh, uh, sleep at night. But always keeping an eye on his father's flock. So before saying that, let me tell you something. 
David was overlooked by everyone, but not by God. When everyone ignored him, God had already chosen him to be king over Israel. So if you are feeling today overlooked or ignored, or if one day something like that happened to you, don't worry. The devil work, will always work hard to try to convince you that you are worthless. That you are incap incapable of something. But don't believe in his lies. God didn't choose you. God didn't choose you in vain. God chose you because he had a purpose in your life. And let me tell you something. God knows your worth. God knows your worth. And you have a great worth for him. There is a story, an interesting story. Proverbs 30. The wise man talks about four little animals. The ant, the grasshopper, the spider, and the, and the, the hyraxis. When we read the NIV version, it says hyraxis. But hyraxis, in fact, are known in Israel as rock badgers. They are mammals, but they look like rodents. But in fact, they are mammals. But something interesting about the rock badgers and the name, their name explains everything. Rock badgers. Why rock badgers? Because they build their house on the rocks. Remember that I told you that once a lion came to steal David's fathership and he stood up against it. He faced the lion, killed the lion. There is an interesting story. I don't know whether it's true or not about rock badgers, but they say in the Middle East that, you know, at that time there were lions. David killed a lion. Samson killed a lion. Lions were found in Israel at that time. And the rock badgers were delish, a delicious meal to the lions. And when a lion would chase against a rock badger to catch it and kill it, what would he do? He would run to his house and take refuge. Where? In the rocks. But there is a, 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 an interesting story that, that I've heard about it, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's very interesting. They say that when a, a, a rock badger ran from a lion and took refuge in his house in the rock, the lions didn't give up easily. The lions wouldn't give up easily. So what would the lions do? The lion do? He, he would start to roar and roar. Louder and louder, louder, to, to scare, to, to scare the rock badger. He, wa he would roar louder and louder to scare the badger and make him feel unsafe in his house in the rocks. And he would leave the house, his house, and the lion would catch it and eat it. When the roar, the roaring didn't work, the lion would show his fangs, his huge fangs and roar and Showing his fangs to make the rock badger scarier than he was. If even so, he didn't leave his safe place in the rock. He would just scratch the rock with his big claws and scratch. Can you imagine a rock badger and the rocks and a lion outside roaring? Have you ever heard the roaring of a lion? I mean... A real roar of a lion, it's something, wow, it gives you goosebumps. Once I went to a, a, a zoo, a, 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 every time I go to the zoo, every time I went to the zoo in the past, I've never seen a lion roaring in front of me. I stood there for a long time, no roaring. Once I was in, in, in a zoo, I don't remember where. And I gave up and I, I was in another part of the zoo, away from the lion cage. But all of a sudden, he roared. 
and I could hear, and it was something amazing. I said, oh my God, this is amazing. And I went back to the lion's cage, but it was only that once that he roared. I would like to see him roaring again. It's something, oh my God, it blows your mind. And can you imagine a small rock badger he then in his house and the, the lion roaring louder and louder and showing his fangs and scratching. And they say that finally the rock badger gets so scared with the, 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 the show the lion was putting up that he leaves his safe place and he's caught by the lion and eaten, devoured by the lion. I think you get the point here. We are, sometimes we are just like the rock badger. We are in a safe place. In our hiding place in the rock. And the lion will try to do everything to scare us out of there. He cannot catch us. He cannot harm us. He can't devour us. But so he will try to uh, lure us out of our cell, uh, hiding place to devour. The Bible says that the devil is around roaring like a lion looking for someone to devour. He is roaring like a lion, but he is around. Why is he around? Because he cannot come close to us. He cannot devour us. He will catch you and devour you or destroy you only if you leave your hiding place in the rock. And Jesus is the rock of our salvation. While we are in Jesus, we are completely safe from the lion who is roaring around looking to devour us. You know that the point is that sometimes we believe in the deceitfulness of of the lion we are we allow ourselves to be enticed by the lion and we leave the safe place that's why we fear that's why we despair that's why sometimes we are so anxious and depressed because we leave our hiding and safe place that is the rock Moses said Lord show me your glory and the Lord said, the Lord God said, I cannot show your God, otherwise you will die. But I'll do something. I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And when I pass, you will see my glory. You know, when we are in the rock, when we take refuge in the cleft of the rock, that is Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God. Why the devil cannot? Why can't the devil, the lion, why is the, 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 the lion around? Roaring, but not close to us because we own when we are in the rock, the glory of God is with us, and he cannot come close to us. The devil, the Satan is darkness, and he cannot approach light. When you are in the rock, so let me tell you, rock badgers, stay in the rock. Take refuge in the rock and stay in the rock. In the rock, you will be surrounded not only by a, a, a natural protection. You will be surrounded by a spiritual, a heavenly, a glorious protection. And the dark lion will never approach you. He will not even touch you. So let me tell you, stay in the rock. Stay in the rock. In the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord uh, wraps it up saying, if you listen to my words and put in practice, you're like what? A wise man 
who laid the foundation of his house on the rock. The windstorm will come, the hurricane will come, the tornadoes will come, but you stay firm there because you laid your foundations in the rock. David was a rock badge. But he never, he never feared the lion. He took refuge in the rock. And he was so full of the glory and power of God that when he left the rock, it was not to be devoured. It was to defeat the lion. The same will happen with us. If we stay in the rock, if we trust in the rock, if we put our trust in Him, seek Him with all our heart every single day, we'll be surrounded by His glory. And when we leave the rock, we will leave to destroy the lion. We live to destroy the lion. I'm not afraid of Satan. I told you that before. I'm not afraid of Satan. If I see someone demon-possessed, I will lay my hands on this person and the devil will be cast out in Jesus' name. I don't run from the devil. I run to the devil to cast him out, to embarrass him. That's what we do. Rock badgers, don't leave the rock. I invite you this morning to not leave the rock. Stay in the rock. And if you are overlooked, if you are ignored, don't worry. God knows your worth. Do you think He would die on the cross for worthless people? No. He died on the cross for people of worth. And you have your worth. Even though your family, even though anyone acknowledges your worth, you have worth. And let me tell you, God does. God does. God does. David had no problem whatsoever with his self-esteem. He was alone. He was overlooked. But he was there with the Heavenly Father. He knew God had a plan in his life. He knew. I believe that in his heart he would say, I know what I, why I'm going through all, all these trials. And we know why. To be the greatest king of Israel. And at times you go through trials. Maybe you are going through your trials right now. Maybe you are faced with tribulations and hardships right now. But let me tell you, if, if, if this is happening in your life, it's not because God doesn't like you or because God overlooked you or he doesn't care about you on the flip it's just the opposite you're going through all of that because he loves you because he wants to prepare you to reign with him by his side by his side so don't complain don't be sad don't feel ignored because you know what God will never ignore you. Ever. You'll never be ignored by God. God knows your worth. And let me tell you, you're worth a lot. More than you could ever imagine. You're worth, you're worth so much for God that He sent His Son to die on the cross for you. He died on the cross for you because you're worth so much for Him. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Hallelujah.